You go ahead and take your Bibles and open up to Matthew chapter 1 again. Over the past two weeks, again, we've been <clears throat> keeping a Christmas theme, and our messages is we've been looking at the names of our Lord in this particular passage. And so uh, two weeks ago, our first week, we looked at the name Emmanuel, which is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, and it was originally from, again, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 17, or chapter 7, verse 14, rather, that says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, in verse 23, we see the meaning of that, which is God with us. God with us. And so as we were looking at the name, we considered two concepts of the God with us theme or Emmanuel. We looked at the hypostat uh, hypostatic union of Christ, which is again where Jesus is 100% God, 100% man in one body. So it is the glorification of God as man. And we looked at the incarnation of Christ, which again is God became flesh, not flesh became God, as many try to uh, say they are here on earth. And so only one time in the history of the world has God ever become flesh, and that was with Jesus Christ. And the apostle John said in John chapter 1, verse 14, that we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. And so I, we looked at, so what kind of glory did the disciples see concerning this Emmanuel? Well, his omniscience. He saw, a, told his disciples, go get a coin out of a fish's mouth. And they obeyed and did it. In his omnipotence, his power over nature and disease and demons and death. The fact that he is sinless and he challenged the Pharisees to convince him of sin. They were accusing him of a bunch of things. The fact that Jesus accepted worship and praise. You know, the angels wouldn't do that. But Jesus, being God, embraced that. And the fact that he is deity, he claimed to be God. And the Jews knew it because they wanted to stone him to death. And so that was concerning Emmanuel. Last week we looked at another place there in verse 18 where it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. And we saw that the name or the word Christ means anointed. And in the Old Testament, people were anointed of oil, again, either to signify God's blessing in their life or their call to a particular office. And so as a prophet, prophets were anointed with oil. And we know that Elijah anointed Elisha with oil in the transferring of the, of the office of prophet. As a priest... Again, the anointing of oil for priests, Moses, God told Moses to take Aaron and anoint him with oil and his sons as an everlasting priesthood. And then for a king, David anointed Solomon. Of course, Nathan had anointed David as, as to be king, but then David anointed Solomon, the third king of Israel. And these men were physically anointed with oil as an official recognition of the office by God and by man. And we also saw last week that Jesus was never anointed as prophet, priest, and king. Not with oil, but he was anointed as the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. Again, when he went to the baptism... John declared who he was, and the Holy Spirit confirmed that as the Holy Spirit anointed Jesus. He was also, Jesus was anointed by Mary later on. But it wasn't again as prophet, priest, or king. She anointed him how? For his burial, for his death. Again, as the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. And so we considered that Jesus, as the Lamb of God would be the atoning sacrifice which was promised in the Garden of Eden with the first sacrifice as God clothed 
Adam and Eve, do you realize that that sacrifice was the first time that death occurred? And it was at God's hands that he slew an innocent animal, probably a lamb. And the reason for that is, in Genesis chapter 4, uh, Abel was a, a keeper of the lamb or of the herd of sheep, and he gave a blood offering. And so we would assume, based on that, that the first offering that God made with Adam and Eve was a, a lamb, which pointed to who? The Passover lamb that was to come. So the lamb, the, the blood that was shed, whether it was bull, whether it was uh, ram, whether it was lamb, it didn't matter. Any blood that was shed was doing what? It was pointing to the one to come to the perfect Lamb of God. So all those sacrifices, and we're talking literally, I, I can't imagine hundreds upon hundreds and hundreds of, of sacrifices to cover the sins, individual sacrifices, sin, uh, sacrifices for the nation. Again, thousands upon thousands upon thousands were sacrificed looking for the Lamb which was to come. Only Jesus can take away the sin of the world. Otherwise, it was merely covered. So he became the atoning sacrifice. He was the propitiation for our sin. 1 John 2, 2 says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. John 3, 16, he didn't, Jesus didn't just die for the Believers, Jesus died for the world. And so his death is for the world. But again, you have to accept that in order to have that blood applied to your individual lives. So Jesus was an atoning sacrifice. But not only that, and again I mentioned then the old Strong's Concordance, which you have to go back and you look, you look up the word propitiation, it means the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, again, sat on top of the Ark. And we saw that when 50,000 looked into the Ark and were in the area of looking in it, God struck them dead. When Uzzah touched the side to try and balance the Ark as it was possibly falling off the cart, God struck him dead. In other words... When you're talking about God in the ark, we're talking about absolute holiness, absolute purity, absolute justice, absolute wrath. And Jesus Christ, the lid of the ark of the covenant, the mercy seat, holds back the wrath of God. I believe today he is holding back the wrath of God from this earth. On both saved and lost. Now, understand what I'm saying here. If God was to judge us as believers, quite honestly, as we deserve to be judged, we'd all perish. But by the grace of God, God has extended His mercy on both the saved and the lost. It rains on the just and the unjust. But there's coming a time when God's wrath will not be held back from the lost. When God's wrath will be eternal in nature. And you know, I can't help but think that God or Jesus, even in our eternal state, because of what He has done, holds back even the wrath of God in the eternal state. So, I know we're going to be changed. I know we're, not, we're no longer going to be sinners. We're not going to have a sinful body. Somehow I just got a feeling if it weren't for the grace of God and if it wasn't for the work of Jesus Christ, we would perish. And so God in His mercy, again, holds back, or Jesus holds back His wrath. And so when we think about that, guys, I want you to know we have a covenant keeping God because of the Lord Jesus Christ. He keeps his word. Now, let's look again at Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. And I know it's familiar, but we don't want it to be familiar as we're reading it. 
Think through it. Let God speak to your heart again. It says, starting in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt name his, shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Father, I pray this morning as we consider another aspect of the names that we see in this passage that you would give us understanding help us to be appreciative of what you've done help us to be able to trust you more in our daily walk and be a be the witnesses that we need to be equip us lord i pray and i ask again that your will would be accomplished in jesus name amen well if you look at 19 and 20 we see in joseph her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, being Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. I want you to notice again in verse 20 that Joseph is called the son of David, not Jesus says, well, wait a minute, I thought we're doing a study on the names of Jesus in this. And we are. Matter of fact, if you look at verse 1 in the genealogy, you see what it say up there, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it goes on, Abraham begat and so forth. And so I'm going to point out again some things here concerning the name son of David because again it, it 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 went from David on down till it got to this point if you look again there in verse one just some key names that we're going to look at this morning Abraham which is again repeated in chapter or verse two go to verse six we see David the king in verse 16 we see Jacob begat Joseph the husband of Mary this is Joseph's lineage, which traces back to David and Abraham. Now, I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn over to Luke chapter 3, if you would. Luke chapter 3, where we see the other genealogy that's recorded. In Luke chapter 3 is actually a genealogy of Mary. Mary was obviously the mother of Jesus. Uh, her lineage went through David to Levi. And Levi was, again, the brother of Moses. And that lineage went on up again to uh, um, some other key names with, with Moses there. But I want you to notice again the key names are in this genealogy. In verse 23, of course, the first name is Jesus. The second one is the son of Joseph. And let me read this, this verse. It says, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, and notice in parentheses, at least in the King James it says, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Oh, wait a minute. It just said in the other scripture that Joseph's father was Jacob. And so what's going on there? Why would one say Heli and the other one say Jacob? 
Well, you notice where it says, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Well, the, the situation was, Heli was Mary's father, not Joseph's father. Very often, again, the genealogies were given to who? The men. And even in this case, that was going, what was going on here. So Heli was, again, the father of Mary, not Joseph, because Jacob was the father of Joseph. Notice how the lineage then continues. In verse 31, if we track the lineage again, it says that toward the end of the verse, the son of David. And I'm not going to read all these names as we're going through here. Just for you to note, son of David. Verse 34, the son of Abraham is mentioned. When we get to verse 36, we see the son of Shem, which was the son of Noah. And in verse 38, we find the son of Adam, which is mentioned. You say, well, why are we looking at these names? What's the importance of this? Well, I want you to take your Bibles again and go to 1 Chronicles chapter 17. 1 Chronicles chapter 17. Because both Joseph and Mary are descendants or were descendants, again, of David, making them the son and the daughter of David. Now over the next couple of weeks, again, or as we've been looking at the importance of names, we've been looking at it from a Jewish perspective. We also considered the importance of covenant relationships as we've been going along. And in the names that we mentioned, four of those names that we saw repeated are one of the four, four of the seven covenants that God has made with man. And so we're going to look at these different covenants in relationship to our Lord. So how does the name Son of David direct us to these covenants? How, do they, how are they fulfilled? How are any of these names fulfilled in Christ? Well, again, there's seven covenants that were established. We're going to start with the middle one, number four, but in the middle because that fits with the context of the Christmas passage. And so we're going to begin with the Davidic covenant, and then we'll look at the three that came prior to that and the three that followed. And we're going to do this again, just a cursory glance because of time. I'm just going to introduce some thoughts for you to consider. And so the first covenant is the Davidic covenant, the Davidic covenant. And it refers to, again, the pro promises of God that were given to David through Nathan the prophet. In 1 Chronicles chapter 17, starting with verse 11, we see the Davidic covenant promises. It says in verse 11, And it shall come to pass, when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. Now we know that Solomon was the first, and then that Davidic line continued. Verse 12, it says, And he shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take away thy mercy or my mercy away from him, as I took it away from him that was before thee, meaning Saul. But I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom, what? Forever. Forever. And his throne shall be established forevermore. See, we need to understand that the Davidic covenant is not a, a conditional covenant. It is an unconditional covenant. What do we mean by that? The fulfillment of that covenant was not based upon the kings of Israel and their actions. Listen, we know David was a sinner. And of course, it was bad. And what he did with Bathsheba and all that was wrong. But his son, Solomon, was far worse than his dad. Far worse if you read about the later end of his life. And yet, it was an eternal throne that was established. God said, I will fulfill this. 
And that's exactly what he's been doing all along. And one day Jesus Christ, the son of David, will take that throne. It's an eternal throne. And so Jesus Christ was called the son of David, referring again to an everlasting kingship that would go through David's house. And it would be established eternally. And that is important to prophecy because again... It is of the house of David that the Messiah would be born, Matthew 21, 9. And so I've been, you know, asked, again, it's amazing. When we think about the, the throne of David being established and where is it going to be in Jerusalem? And I probably have had at least five or six phone calls from people asking me, what do you think about President Trump? making an announcement last week about Jerusalem, we're going to recognize Jerusalem as being the capital of Israel, that we're going to move our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's one step closer for sure. Because before the temple can be rebuilt, I think Jerusalem has to be completely controlled by the Jews. Whether the dome on a rock falls over the hill, whether uh, their forensic experts decide or figure out, hey, that's not really where the rock is, it's over here. Whatever it's going to be, when the Jews start to build that temple, it's going to be a problem. And so I personally think it's one more step closer. Now guys, here's the thing from a prophetic point of view. The Antichrist is going to offer the abomination of desolation at the midway point. There's no question about that. Daniel's prophecy, and again in Matthew chapter 24 and Luke and Mark's accounts, the, the abomination of desolation is going to be offered. When that is offered by the Antichrist, they don't seem as the Antichrist. They seem as the Christ. And so that temple is going to get built. And you know what? We could start seeing the blocks laid, who knows, very, very soon. But it's going to be three and a half years out that the Antichrist, again, will step in and offer that abomination of desolation. So how close are we? I don't know. I know one thing, that since Israel was taken out by Babylon that Israel has never had the control of Jerusalem as they had at one time. Not even during Rome. During Rome's times, I'm talking about the control, again, they didn't have control to do as they saw fit. They were still under the, the emperor's control. And so we're coming to a time in history where I believe, again, uh, we're, we're, again, we are seeing prophecy unveiled in front of us the thing i would encourage you about in all this is remember one thing the future king will not be the antichrist the future king will be the king of kings and the lord of lords Amen. see our god is a covenant keeping god through jesus christ our lord he keeps his word there's three covenants which god made before the adamic or I'm sorry, the uh, Davidic covenant. The first is the Adamic covenant. And that covenant had two parts. Innocence was part of it. In other words, what was going on in the Garden of Eden? Well, Adam and Eve were sinless. They were simply instructed on how to take care of the world, how to do the things that needed to be done to till the garden. Adam had a responsibility. He named all the animals. And the rest of the time, I think it was just really nice. But there was another part of that Adamic covenant that dealt with judgment coming on the earth, and it was tied in with grace, though. And that judgment came, why? Because the world was cursed because of the sin of Adam. And with that curse, again, death was placed upon Adam and Eve, Curse was placed on the world. The serpent was cursed. The curse of sin came upon the world. You know, when we talk about illness and so forth here in our congregation and things that have gone on and you've read about and everything else, 
It's not because man's good. It's the results of a fallen world. And our bodies, we are sinners saved by grace. We're getting older. I don't care how I might want my hair to turn a different color. Unless I color it, it's getting grayer and it's getting more scarce back here. That's called age. We are wearing out. And so we can do anything we want to do. A good friend of mine, well, you all probably know John Cerrone, uh, was taken to the hospital. And he's very athletic and all kinds of things and, and overdid it. And his heart started causing problems as he was working out. They had to take him to the hospital. Went in and did a, 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 a not a stent, but went in and did a heart cath. He's got some issues, probably going to have, maybe somewhere down the road, have to have a pacemaker. But I've tried to tell him, exercise will kill you. Stop doing that. They didn't listen. But you know, we are, we literally, we are, regardless of what we do, what we eat, how we take care of ourselves, we're still going to die. We're going to die. Barring the Lord coming back in the rapture. We were born, and from the moment we were conceived, oh, we, we've grown, but we were going out. From the moment we were conceived. And so when we look at that, again, what is holding back even the wrath of God at this time? It's the fact that our God is a covenant-keeping God. And when that blood was shed, again, for those animals, it was a covering until the Lamb of God would come. And so the Adamic covenant was there. The Noahic covenant, again, it was again an unconditional covenant between God and Noah, which was extended to all of mankind after the flood. And God promised that he would never again destroy the world with water, and he set a rainbow in the sky. And I've seen some just recently as a reminder again of God's covenant promise. You know, another aspect of that covenant re resulted in the fact that God preserved righteous seed through Noah in Shem. So the righteous line continued from Adam through Noah through Shem. God has always kept his covenant promise. And although God has showed mercy to the world in the fact that the whole world has never been destroyed by water again, we know there is coming destruction. God says he is going to destroy the world with fire 2 Peter 2, 5. And that the firmament will melt away before the new heaven and the new earth take place in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And so again, we can thank God that we have a covenant keeping God through Jesus Christ. The third covenant is the Abrahamic covenant. And again, that covenant is revealed in Genesis chapter 12, 13, 15, 17, and 22. And that covenant, again, was God's promise that he would make, first of all, Abraham a great name. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. That Abraham's seed would be as the sand or as the stars in heaven. Genesis 13, 16. That Abraham would be the father of many nations. Genesis 17, verses 4 and 5, and that the geographical boundaries that would be Israel would be as far as Abraham could see as he would mark, he was able to mark out the territory. And that's seen in Genesis 12, 7, 13, 14, and 15, and chapter 15, verses 18 to 21. And you say, why is that so important? Well, what's going on over there now? It's all about territorial stress and strain and who should have this and who should have that. And so again, right now Israel does not possess the land that they should be possessing. It has been extremely limited. And one of the things in the past 
really you could almost go back to not 1948 but probably 10 years after that has been Israel trying to appease the enemy trying to do whatever they can almost a peace at all costs and we've seen in our lifetimes those of us who are older where again some of the prime ministers were willing to give away the store hoping they'd have peace and I can well imagine when the Antichrist comes on the scene and he's going to overwhelm them with his wisdom and he's going to offer the solutions, they are going to embrace that. They will sign that covenant, a seven-year covenant. And so we see those parts of the Abrahamic covenant, but the greatest provision of that covenant was the promise to Abraham that all the families of the earth would be blessed by his seed. And Paul confirms exactly what Moses was writing about. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 16 to 18, it says this, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Plurality of words there. It was the seed, Christ, who would bless the earth. And so when we start reading Scripture, we need to make sure that we look at what the Word of God is actually saying. Verse 17 of Galatians 3 says this, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Since be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So what's that mean? Abraham came before the law. The promise was given to Abraham. The law is not the promise. What is the law? The law shows us our sinfulness. It shows us our need of a Savior, but it is never saved. You know, we've seen, again, God fulfill a great promise in the fact of of gathering together His people. And we're going to see this here again in just a minute. But since 1948 again, we've seen God continues to work out His promise of fulfilling, again, the Abrahamic covenant. And it's not going to be long again, I think, until that covenant is completely fulfilled. And quite honestly, the gates of hell are not going to stop it. So God's will is going to be accomplished. And Jesus will return to set up his kingdom. And he will sit in the seat of David, in the throne of David, ruling his kingdom. Why is that? Because our God is a covenant-keeping God. He's a covenant-keeping God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what's in a name? Well, we've looked at the Adamic from Adam, the Noahic, Noah, the Abrahamic, Abraham, and the Davidic covenants. Those names mean something. They have meant something to the Jews and they mean something to us as believers. Why? Because those covenants with God made with man show forth the glory and the grace and the mercy of God. What a blessing that we fall under those. Now, on the other side of the divinic covenant, there's three last covenants, very quickly. The Palestinian covenant or the land covenant. Again, as you know, in history, Israel has not been a nation that's obeyed. They've disobeyed God on many times. And the, the time again the, the where God dealt forcefully with, with them was in 70 AD. When God, and I believe God rules the king's hands, had the emperor send the military in under Titus in 70 AD to destroy the temple, to slaughter the people, and to scatter whatever was left throughout the world. Why was that? They rebelled against God and continue to rebel against a God, even though Jesus Christ had died for them some 40 years earlier. And so God himself knew the people were going to disobey, and he still maintains 
his covenant, and one of them happens to be the land covenant. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 3 and 4 says this, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee. I will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the, world, the Lord thy God has scattered thee. Well, we could say 1948 was the beginning of that, but let me tell you, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, they're going to be scattered again. There will be another gathering at the end of the tribulation period. And if any be driven out into the uttermost parts of heaven from thence, will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence he will fetch thee. Verses 8 and 9 says this, and this is the blessing of it. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thy hand, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy land for good. And the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good as he rejoiced over thy fathers. We know during the millennial kingdom it's going to be an incredible blessing here on the earth as the earth is restored in every facet. What a blessing it's going to be. And so that Palestinian covenant again will be confirmed when Jesus Christ takes his rightful place as the King of kings and the Lord of lords on his throne. Our God is a covenant-keeping God through Jesus Christ. The Mosaic covenant. It was a conditional covenant that either brought God's blessing for obedience or God's cursing for disobedience. And it included the law, the Ten Commandments that we see primarily from Exodus chapter 20, as well as the rest of the law. And we know how the Jews worked it out, 365 days, 243 others. Again, they had their whole system. But it was not their for man to do to try to keep to earn salvation. It was there to show the difference between the righteous God and unrighteous man so that we might see our need for a Savior. And a Savior, again, that had to be absolutely pure and holy and righteous. And only Jesus could meet that requirement. There was no one else Remember what he said when he spoke to his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. He says, again, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what? To fulfill it. He was the only one who could fulfill that. Why? Again, he was God in the flesh. And Israel needed a perfect, sinless sacrifice to be offered for their sins. So by faith... We believe that Jesus Christ is our substitutionary atonement. He took our place on the, on the cross. He suffered God's wrath in our place. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, this goes back again. Christ alone. Christ alone was the sacrifice. Because every animal sacrifice only covered were Christ removed. Our God is a covenant-keeping God. And then the last covenant, the new covenant, is a covenant made first with the nation of Israel, but ultimately it's offered to all mankind and it's applied to believers. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34 says this, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. And listen to what this says. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord. Why? For they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Can you imagine a population where you don't have to 
be concerned and say, hey, you need, to, you need to get saved. You need to know the Lord. Why? I don't need to say that. Everybody's saved. Everybody's a believer. There's coming that time. In the new covenant, God promises to forgive sin. There will be a universal knowledge of the Lord. Jesus, the one who came to fulfill the law and the prophets, the law of Moses, it will be complete, totally complete. And there will be a new covenant between God and His people. Now, we're under that new covenant in one sense. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't have to... Uh, you, you don't have to go to a believer who's truly a believer and say, you need to know the Lord. We fall under that. Matter of fact, Gentiles are free of the penalty of the law. Christ has broken down the wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. We're grafted into the promises of Israel. Romans chapter 11, verses 8 to 20, or 18 to 20. So folks, I want you to know something here in closing. Our salvation is un conditional on our part it's unconditional it's a covenant that's based upon God fulfilling his promise to us God said if you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ you shall be saved you know what again I know how I lived after I was a Christian as a teenager. I know how God got a hold of my heart at age 19. I know I still sin. But there's a difference in my mindset. And it's not because I'm, I'm something special. No, it's because God's doing a work in me. And he's promised he will do it. And he will continue to do it. That he will make me more like the image of Christ. And that's the same promise to given to any who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you've trusted Jesus Christ, you are eternally secure in him. You can't earn it. You can't keep it. All that you can do is pass it on. You can make others aware of their need of Jesus Christ. And so we have a God again who keeps his covenants in the names that are recorded in Scripture. Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of Noah, the son of Adam. And then we have the other covenants as well. Guys, we are so blessed as believers.